We are in the book of Judges, chapter 13, and we're dealing with today, Making a Man of Steel. One of the modern-day fictional heroes is Superman. Superman was labeled as the Man of Steel. The first movie that hit the cinema screen, for you movie buffs, was in 1978. Then, of course, in 2013, the Superman movie entitled Man of Steel was shown in theaters uh, everywhere. And, of course, just released is the movie that pits Superman against Batman. Maybe some of you movie buffs have been to the movie theater and seen that. Superman is the most popular fictional hero of the justice system in the movie industry. But in Judges 13, we find Samson is the most popular judge throughout the dawn of justice in what we would call the Old Testament, as God's Word describes it. Samson is a man of steel who possesses great strength and also who possesses great ability. Now, this incredible man of steel, he kills a lion, and he also kills a bear with his bare hands. And he slays a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. That's a pretty stout dude. Samson could break ropes like we would snap rubber bands. However, God would raise up, and we see what happens in him in his life. How would God raise up this man of steel? What would be the elements? What would be the attributing attributes in his life? Samson's story, I think, is different than Superman because he's not from another planet. And uh, Samson is created by God for a particular purpose. Now, realizing this, God also created and made you and I also for a particular purpose. He has a design. He has a plan for our individual single lives today. That he wants our lives to glorify him. So God had a unique plan for Samson's life. Going to Judges chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It seems like this is a recurring theme for the children of Israel. It's just over and over as we have been studying the book of Ezekiel on Wednesday nights. The problem continued there. The problem was uh, throughout the pages of the Old Testament, the situations that they faced where they could not seem to get victory in living for the Lord. So you can become today, and we've got to understand something. You had better be careful of sin. And I know we're living in a day and a generation that glorifies sin, exalts sin, paints a pretty picture of sin, and however, it never shows the results of sin. You can become so accustomed to sin and you can become so accustomed to its consequences today that you don't care whether you break the cycle of sin or not. You just continue to sin and sin and sin. Well, what, is, what this is called in the Bible is called the hardening of the heart towards God. And folks, we're living in such a generation today where people are hardening their hearts towards God. You know, I've watched Facebookers and uh, I've seen who and how that professing Christians uh, get on there, yet they get on there with no convictions whatsoever. They talk about ungodly lifestyles in their lives. Uh, they use language that is unbecoming of a Christian. They talk about habits and things that surely does not glorify the Lord. And, you know, no sensitivity today, and this is the generation that we're living in, there's no sensitivity today to holy living. That is, and this is what's hardening the hearts of men. People have no regard for the things of God. No regard for holiness. No regard for sanctification. No regard for God, period. So, and how about professing Christians that once used to be faithful to the house of the Lord, but they begin skipping and missing services? And you know, it's very easy to do. You begin laying out on Sunday nights, and then that progresses into Wednesday night. And the next thing you know, you're totally out of the house of the Lord. So a hardening begins to happen. And what happens with Christians? We start grabbing every excuse for not being in the house of the Lord. 
Well, you know, you can try to appease your own self with that, but it doesn't cut any, any uh, ice with God. If you're missing God's house to going out and doing things that you are for, forsaking God's house, you need to think about that. Well, preacher, you know, we all need pleasure. We all need God. And we all need to be in his house. So today, prioritizing the Lord should be the priority of our life. So the worship becomes more of the exception rather than the rule of our lives. And if you give sin a place, I'm going to tell you what it will do. It will move in. If you open the door and the opportunity for Satan to cause you to sin, he will take advantage of that opportunity. Judges 13, the children of Israel were in sin, and they were also in a position of oppression. See, sin and oppression go together. So for 40 years, they have been in bondage to the Philistines. However, it didn't seem to bother them. Their sinning and their, their lifestyle of, of ignoring God really made no impact on their lives. You know, sometimes believers are content to go with the flow and be like the culture around them. You know, we want to look like everybody else. We want to conduct ourselves like everybody else. And we just want to blend in with the world. Folks, the Word of God says, Come out from among them, be you separate, saith the Lord. And so therefore today, I believe that we should be examples of God's grace. We should be living examples of how God has miraculous cha miraculously changed our life. So it's easier to blend in and to tolerate compromise than to be the salt and the light. Well, Jesus talked about salt. He talked about light. He said you're to be the light of the world. He says that you're to let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. We are to be the salt. What does salt do? Yeah, preacher, it preserves. Yeah, but it also today irritates. And we need to irritate this world with the holiness of God to let them know that we don't fall for those things that Satan today uh, is infiltrating our society with. We face realities on what people say rather than on what God says. So we go with opinion rather than going with the fact of God's word. Now in Judges 13, God raises up a judge. His name is Samson. You know, the only thing that we remember about Samson typically is the fact that he went to the devil's barbershop and he got his hair cut and he lost his strength and ultimately his life became a failure. Well, you know, before you remember all the bad things about Samson, let's see about how God began his life. See, a lot of people begin well, but they don't run the race with patience. They don't continue to serve the Lord. They get off track. So I'm glad, you know, God raised up this man whose name would be Samson, and he would be a great and fantastic judge. But praise God, God also raised up a righteous judge. And his name is called the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm glad in Romans 5 and 8, the Bible says, Where we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank the Lord he made a, a, a payment for our sins in full, completely, and totally, that we could be liberated and set free and not held in the bondage of sin. So God raised up a Savior. God put him on the cross. God made a way for us that we could be set free. And I'm glad the Word of God still declares when the Son sets free is free indeed. Now, Samson in the Old Testament, this man of steel, he served a twofold purpose. The first purpose that he served was simply this, to deliver the people of God from the Philistines. And so, therefore, God would mightily use him and provide him the opportunity of service that would glorify God and bring good to the people. So, first, to deliver the people of God from the oppression of the Philistines. Secondly, today, to point us to the person of Jesus Christ, who for only uh, in Christ are we delivered from the sins of our sins eternally. And I'm glad what God works in us, thank the Lord, is an eternal transaction. I'm glad he is able to keep that which he saves. I know we got a lot of things going on within the ranks of churches today, uh, and especially doubting the fact of the salvation that God provides for us. I'll tell you, you can't show me anywhere in this Bible where God takes away your salvation. I believe that you're eternally secure in him, but you've got to learn to live what God's giving you, right? So studying the origin of Samson reveals I believe two important lessons about life as we should be living for the Lord. The first lesson we're looking at today is the priority of God's plan for your life. You know, God has a plan for you. 
God just didn't put you in this world to exist. That's our mentality sometimes in our conversation. Well, I'm just holding on, getting by, all those cliches that we use. And we just look at life as drudgery as one day at a time and trying to get by and get through what we're facing. That's not the way God wants you to live. Do you believe that God has a, a priority and a plan for your life today? Say amen. Well, in Judges 13, 2 through 23, we see that God gives us an account preparing Samson to do great works in Israel. You know, even though times were bad then, as even as times are bad now, God can still do the miraculous. God can still do what is beyond our comprehension and understanding. So these verses reveal the detailed nature in which God charts our lives to accomplish his plan. And you know, it's not always easy, is it? Sometimes you have to go through the valleys to get to the victories. And you've got to understand and learn today. It's in the struggles of life where you really grow and you mature in your faith walk with God. Be assured God knows every day of your life. You may think, well, man, I got a bad day going on. Nobody knows what I'm going through. You can be assured of this one thing. God knows everything that you're facing, going through, and encountering. And God is on the throne. You, will have, you have nothing to fear if you will make the priority of God's plan for your life your number one goal in life. So you've got to seek the Lord. So living according to God's plan today ought to be a great priority for every Christian. It should be our desire to live for the Lord. So when you do that, I want you to note with me God's plan for Samson. Go into verse 2 of Judges 13. And there was a certain man of Zorah and the family of Dantes, whose name was uh, Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. She couldn't bear a son or a child. So Samson is fortunate to have parents that in spite of the wicked culture of that day, they kept a focus, and they were godly parents. They were godly people. This couple could not have children. So this, this couple in, in walking with God, and in Judges 13, 3, there's an answer that comes to their prayers. Aren't you glad that God answers prayer today? You know, you never give up on God and what God can do because he can work all things appropriately and accordingly as his will dictates for our lives. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Oh, hallelujah. I'm sure there was joy in the house of this woman. And Manoah. This baby was not only the goodness of God towards the parents, that God would honor them for their faithfulness to him, but also it's the goodness of God towards the whole nation of Israel, that God would raise up a man to be a great judge. When God answered their prayers and gave them a child, God also began to raise up a deliverer that would lead the children of Israel out of the bondage that they were in. As we continue in Judges 13, verses 4 and 5, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for, lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now notice the plan of God for Samson, and the priority that is given to Samson. You know, where God has a plan, God has a priority. And you've got to seek out what God's plan is. Then in verse 5, Samson begins to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistine. God's plan for Samson was determined actually before he was born. You know, God already knows the chart and compass of your life. Unfortunately, we get our eyes off of the Lord, and that's where we fall. That's where we get out of the plan. That's where we get into sin. That's where our hearts are hardened. But I'm glad today God is still in the restoration business, and that he can get you back on the path that he wants you to be upon. As a side note that speaks to the value of all human life, and even in the womb. So this is important today to know that Samson's, God's plan for his life was determined before he even came out of this world screaming. Amen. 
Remember the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 and 5. It says, before I, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou, canst, before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. So for Jeremiah, God already knew that he was going to be a great prophet to Israel. God knew that Samson was going to be a great judge for Israel. Before you were born, God formed you. And you know what he did? He created you and I for a specific purpose. What you've got to do is get into the will of God so that you can know what that plan and that priority is. You've got to seek out and search out what God's direction is for your life. God not only knows the plans that he has for your life, but he knows the number of days as well as the purpose of our days. So, you know, we, we are given and we come into this world with two dates. We come into this world with a birth date. You come into this world with a date that you don't know what it's going to be, a death date. But in that, in that space of time, God then works a new birth in your life that is called salvation. And he redeems and saves your soul. Well, you know, God knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And I'm glad today that God knows today that we can call on him and receive him as our Savior and that our lives can be gloriously changed to the glory of God. So he has a specific thing that he wants to accomplish in Samson's life. He has a, a specific thing that he desires to accomplish in your life and my life. Note this, God has not given up on you. When people give up on us, when our families give up on us, I'm glad that we've got a God who never gives up on us. And I'm glad we've got a God today that can turn our lives around. So God's plan became a priority for Samson. Samson was to follow the Nazarite law. Well, you, as you heard read, and as you're going to hear more, there was specific, uh, specific things that they are to do and not to do. That was a Nazarite vow. And every believer who wants to make... God's plan, a priority, must commit to walk today in purity before the Lord. You've got to keep your life clean. You've got to keep sin out of your life. And if you commit sin, thank God if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so realizing this, we've got to commit ourselves to the Lord's plan. See, God didn't put you on this wor world or in this, on this earth to accomplish your plans because your plans and my plans are lesser plans. His plans are greater plans. His plans are better plans. And when we get into the plan of God, let me tell you what, that's the place where God can bless you. You know why so many Christians are not blessed? Because they're not in the plan of God. They're not prioritizing the things of God. So we are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Praise God. So we are to be separated from sin and separated to the Savior. That's why Jesus, excuse me, why Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The problem is that we want the will of God for our benefit and not for his glory. See, we want what God's got to give to benefit us, but we're not willing to give God the glory for what he does in our lives. So in our culture, we would rather find the will of God rather than walk with God. Folks, you can know the will of God, but if you're not walking with God, you're not fulfilling the will of God. Let's move on. It's verses 6 through 8 of Judges 13. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. In other words, very awesome. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive, bear a son, and now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Verse uh, 8, Then Man Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God, I'm sure he did say that and probably with more exuberance than I did, 
Let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Now, Samson had godly parents. You know, that's the greatest calling, honestly, to raise up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That is a calling of God. And you know what? If you will invest God's word in your children, there may be places and times that they may stray, but they'll always come back. Hallelujah. Don't give up on them. So Samson had godly parents. These godly parents had an earnest desire to raise their children as God or their child as God wanted them to do. You know, if you'll raise your child by the word of God, your children will grow up to be mightily used of the Lord. Amen. Much of God's plan for your life today will be revealed by parents who have walked with God and do their best to, God, to guide and to counsel you today. So God answered the prayer. God said it's going to be a child, it's going to be a happy day for Manoah and his wife. You're going to have a baby. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How would some of you like to get that news? The angel of the Lord appeared in you and said, you and your wife are going to have a baby. Holy smoke. Amen. <laughs> Judges 13. We better read on. Amen. You, some of you getting nervous. Amen. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the, the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to, this, to the man and said, I can see, you know, she said, he's back. He came back again. And she kind of turns around and walks off. He said, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And so behold, the man hath appeared. And um, Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that speaketh unto the woman? <laughs> and he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let the word come to pass. He said, Thank you for bringing some good news. Amen. How shall we order the child and how, sh and, and how shall we do unto him? Manoah is asking the angel of the Lord, how are we going to raise this child? You know, in these days in which we're living, the question parents and folks, couples have children, and they may ask in this horrible generation and society and culture that we're living in, how am I going to raise my child? You're going to raise your child by the Word of God. If you'll raise your children by the Word, I'm telling you, God will mightily bless your child and bless your home. So this is a critical question. Actually, what Manoah was asking this, this angel of the Lord is a critical question that I think every parent ought to ask the Lord. Show me, Lord, how to raise my children. It is the parent's responsibility to raise godly children. Amen. It is not the television set's responsibility. It is not the Xbox and all the other video games that's out there. It's not the cartoon industry. It is your responsibility to raise your children. Amen. And if we will learn to raise our children up today, not sitting in front of a television, but actually sitting at a dinner table and sharing and talking about their life, I tell you, we could raise up a lot better children than we're doing. Amen. So the angel of the Lord answered the question. That's how we grew up, and I'm telling you, it worked. Cynthia and I grew up that way. Amen. Amen. Uh, we didn't eat our meals with our nose on a video game or television every night. We sit around the table. As a matter of fact, we didn't have a television for a long time. Amen. Maybe we need to go back to some of those days, huh? Amen. I'm not giving up my TV, preacher. You can forget that. All right. You just keep your nose glued to that, and uh, you miss the blessings of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, there's nothing wrong with your television set. Just don't let your television set have you. Amen. Control your life. Spend time with God. So the angel of the Lord answered the question of Manoah. Verses 13 and 14. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, 
of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything. Here it is again. They, you may not eat of anything that cometh out of the vine. Neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her obs observe. See, observe the word of God. So this was the Nazarite vow. Now, the guiding principle of this passage is, if you want to know God's plan for your life, then you got to walk in purity. You will walk in purity when you prioritize God in your living. So we prove God's will through our purity. If you want to know God's plan, you've got to walk with him every day. See, this is just not a Sunday thing, friend. This is just not an occasional Sunday, Wednesday, whatever time. This is an everyday thing that we are to walk with God. You don't have to go looking for the will of God. God will make his will obvious and reveal it unto you today. So to know God's will for your life, you've got to make two commitments. And let me give them to you. Time's running out quickly, so let me turn up the speed here a little bit. You've got to make these two commitments. One, you've got to learn to walk in purity. You've got to learn to walk and not be controlled by sin. Secondly today, you've got to learn to think the way God wants you to think. Well, I don't know how God wants me to think. Well, put it this way. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do I get the mind of God? Right here. The word of God. You're not going to know God's mind if you're not in his book. You're not going to know God's mind if you're not in prayer. You're not going to know God's mind if you're not in worship. So today, if you're not in those things, then you're walking around dumber than dirt. Spiritually. I mean, really. That's kind of hard, preacher. Well... That's the problem. We've glazed things too long in our society, and we need to call it the way it is. So, you know, if you're walking around ignorant in the Word, then that's your choice. God wants you to have the mind of Christ. So you don't find the will of God, you prove. You know, I've heard people say, I'm trying to find the will of God. Well, my Lord, have mercy. You're never going to find it because you can't find the will of God. You prove the will of God for your life. And you discover the will of God in the word of God. Amen. Romans 12 and 2. This puts it plain and clear. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the problem is not that God refuses to guide you. The problem is that we don't recognize his direction. We're confused. Why are we confused? Because we're listening to the ways of the world and we don't know which way to go. You can't find his direction on social media. Hello. I'm telling you today, I have nothing against Facebook. But folks, if we would spend as much time, I challenge you this week, for every minute, hour, whatever you spend on Facebook, I challenge you to read scripture that same amount of time. Praise the Lord. This is the best thing you can do. Honestly, Facebook has made a lot of money. The people that develop this have made a lot of money out of people's drama. I'm serious. Amen. You don't need it. You really don't need it. What you need is God and his word. Social media. Yeah, but I cannot do without it. You're addicted to it and you need to get broken from that. Hello. Some, I t some people... I go on that, and I tell you, y'all must, must sleep with that thing beside you. You must have it on your phone all the time. I mean, you must have that phone logged into Facebook. Something can't come up, and boom, they're right on it. I think, what do you do with your time that you're on Facebook all the time? Well, as the fellow said, you need to get a life. You can't find this direction on television. Yeah, but I listen to all those television preachers. Well, that's well and good. But I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You need to get in church and listen to your pastor. Amen. Amen. Whew. You can't find his direction. Gossiping, fault finding, judging other people that you know nothing about. Amen. Gossip is nothing but the work of the devil. And if you do it, then you're doing the devil's work. If you run around telling everybody else about it, somebody else, all you're doing is doing the devil's work. You find his direction in his word. 
You have to meditate on it. You've got to study it. You've got to contemplate it. You've got to memorize it. It's got to consume you. I mean, it's just got to be a part of you. If you have the written instruction of God, listen, doesn't it make sense that we are to read it? Amen. So if Christians ran their business, if you had a great business, and you ran your business the way that you run your minds, you'd be broken 12 months because you're not absorbing the mind of Christ. So Manoah asked the evidence in 17 and 18. Man, I've both run out of time. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thou saying, Come to pass, we may do, these, do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thus? After my name, sin, it is secret. Now, in verses 21 through 23, let me just do a summary here. Manoah and his wife are filled with fear. And so the Lord, this is the Lord revealing himself. And remember, God has a priority in his plan for your life today. Then you go to the second thing. We come to the power of God's potential in your life that is unleashed. The power of God's potential in your life then is unleashed. Judges 13, 24 is a summary of the entire, chi entire childhood of Samson. Now, the name Samson means little son. Now, Samson had tremendous potential because he had parents that made God's plan for him the top priority of their life. And you need to make God's plan the top priority in your life. If God's plan for your life becomes your greatest priority, then the power of God's potential is unleashed in your life. So it's amazing what God will do through a yielded life to his kingdom. So you can't be whatever you want to be. I know the world says that. You can be whatever you want to be. I mean, they've even written songs about it. And even to the point, I did it my way. That's the problem. I can't stand that song either. I did it my way. Yeah. Yeah, i tell you what his way got him. A lot of alcohol and a lot of trouble. Amen. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You can't be whatever you want to be. Because when you're being what you want to be, you're being lesser. Be who God's called you to be. Potential is about being everything God wants you to be. Locked inside of you today is the potential of God. And God wants to release that potential in your life. If you say, God can't use me, you know what you're doing? You're doubting today. You're not doubting yourself. Well, I just don't have the ability and I can't do this and I can't do that and whatever, whatever. You know what the problem is today? You're not doubting yourself. You're doubting God. Because God can do all things in our life if you'll submit your life to him. See, God is growing our faith to do his kingdom work. So therefore today, God's goal is not to make you miserable. God's goal is to make you blessed. The final word, and here it is. How, do you be how you begin is important, but how you finish is far more important. God wants you to finish victorious, but you're not going to do it if you ignore the word and ignore God. Put him first and see what God would mightily do in your life. Well, we got a whole lot more on Mr. Samson to cover. And uh, we're going to see some things that happened in his life over the next few weeks. But you know, these, these judges that God used were absolutely amazing. And if we will glean from what God has given us in his word, God can do amazing things in our life. Amen. Remember today, how you begin is important, but how you, what? Finish is far more important. Thank you, Father, for the time in the Word. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us. So we will just declare, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Now, Lord, as we conclude this time of study and enter into a season of worship today, may our hearts be pulled to, drawn to, and amazed by your mighty presence here in this place of worship. May you be high and lifted up, exalted and praised. May our focus be on Jesus today. Have your way, have your will, be praised and honored by your people. 
In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, what? Amen. Amen.